I was about 18 years old, and I lived a riotous life. And my friend and I used to do things that we shouldn't. We sold drugs. And one, one, one Christmas Eve, it occurred to both of us that we should go to church. It wasn't drug-induced either. It was just a thought that we should go to church. And we got dressed up and whatever that meant for us. And uh, we combed our afros, no doubt. And, uh, and we went to this church. And you know, those people did not want us to come there. For the longest time, I didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. If someone were African-American person and they wanted to join the church, I would have to warn them that perhaps some of the lofty ideas, and I mean genuinely lofty ideas and precepts which attracted them to the church, uh, may not be made manifest in everyone that they meet. So if they're looking for perfection, they're, they're looking in the wrong place. If they're looking for the potential of finding perfection, then maybe they're on to something. But they will be offended. But Jesus said, Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Offenses will come as well. But even now I'm in negotiation with certain hierarchs in the church who, um, you know, who want to bring a, a group of African-American people into the church. At the same time, they're not leveling with them. They're not leveling with them. They're not telling them that there will be all kinds of obstacles, even from priests and bishops who might not understand that, um, you know, that, they, that they need certain accommodations, not as Christians, but as human beings. And, uh, and some of them are, you know, some of them are ashamed of, of African-American people and their worship and they, and they sometimes, sometimes make fun of it, not in a malicious way, but in just sort of a, you know, good old American joking way. Um, so I would tell them to be prepared to, to be persecuted. And the persecution does not come from the individuals within the church. The persecution comes from the evil one who's the father of lies, who wants to separate us anyway. And so they use everything that they can. My life in the Orthodox Church has been pleasant as well as challenging, for I know the joys and discomforts of farm life. So that's, that's about the way it has been for me. It's been a, it's been a, a comfort and also a, a challenge. It's been a challenge in that um, this is a this is the ancient church with all the teachings that are salvific contained within her. And at the same time, it's comprised of people who are, um, you know, like me, um, fallen men and women. And so it's always, there's been a challenge as far as, um, it's been a challenge as far as, um, you know, race is concerned. It's been a challenge as far as uh, being independent to a certain degree, be, need, needing to be independent to a certain degree and not abandoning my own uh, American Christian roots while at the same time, um, you know, being integrated in the Orthodox Church, which is the Church of the Apostles which has been a hard thing to do. Because I've known many people, and especially young people who are converts to the church uh, of all different races, but particularly I've noticed this among African-American people, they sort of abandoned, they abandoned their, um, their heritage. They abandoned their own roots in favor of integrating with the rest of orthodoxy. As, as it's 
demonstrated in America today. When in fact, um, you know, our experience makes up our Orthodox life, just as much as uh, as, as the, the the Russian folk tradition makes up um, the the Russian Orthodox Church, or the Greek folk tradition makes up the Greek. Uh, or, or the Antiochians, or any other uh, particular uh, so-called nationalistic church, is made up of people who are from, um, you know, from the folk culture. So it's been hard. It's been hard keeping that balance because there's certain sort of unspoken, um, unspoken forces that try and draw me away from that unspoken forces that make me want to abandon, uh, you know, even speaking about, um, you know, my forefather's struggle in this country. And at the same time, hearing people laud the achievements of uh, the founding fathers, and at the same time, having to abandon my forefathers. That's sort of a, it's a, it's a, it's a razor's edge. It's a, it's a thin line to walk. And I know it has nothing ultimately to do with salvation. And it doesn't save you. But, you know, we are saved uh, using who we are and what we are. And I think what I am is a little bit... Um, unique in the Orthodox Church today, because I, I refuse to be anything other than, uh, than an, an, an actual black man in, um, you know, in the, in the Orthodox world. Salvation lies within the Orthodox Church uh, and within the ancient teachings of the church. That's where we find our salvation. And when we buy the field, when we, when, when we find the pearl that's hidden in the field, we, 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 we sell everything, we buy the whole field. And, and, and you know, that's, what I, that's why you stick with it. You don't, you don't, you don't marry a wife and suddenly find out that, 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 that she's not um, you know, your Queen Guinevere. Uh, she's just uh, flesh and bones like everybody else but you still love her and you can't do without her. So that's the way it is in the, you know, in the, for me in the church. You know, I've been looking for those flowers as we spoke about earlier in God's garden that look like me and I wasn't able to find them. The Orthodox Church belongs to Jesus and we are inheritors of, of the church that Jesus Christ established. And if we don't see this in a most mystical way, we miss the point. We miss the point entirely. I've come to the realization that, that I asked, that I owe such a debt to God, such a tremendous debt, that I can never repay it. Not only can I never repay it, I can never get to the bottom of how much I owe. So I must say, oh, Lord, help me. Please help me, because I can't pay, can't pay you back. Don't even remember it. We're reminded of the man who owed so much, and he couldn't pay it back in the Scripture from a parable that Jesus speaks about. And he could not pay it back. And he asked the man to forgive him his debt. And then the man said, of course, forgive you. You're forgiven. Get out of here. And then he came across someone who owed him just a small amount. And he grabbed him by the neck and he cast him into prison and his whole family and said, we'll not release you until you pay the very last farthing. And all he had to do was forgive those who he had offended. And those who ask for his offense, ask for his forgiveness, just immediately forgive them, no matter what. Don't, don't try and figure out if they should get it. Don't try and figure out if they're deserving of your forgiveness for your own salvation, for your own, because there's no other way you can escape.
You know why? Because that's what Jesus said. So this is what comes to me lately. I mean, it comes to me lately about, about the people that I have offended and, um, and, and my neglect of other people and, uh, you know, my uh, putting myself first, you know, and my own um, comfort before uh, ministering to someone else. Uh, it's in the most subtle ways, not just the gross ways. The gross ways you don't even know about, because everybody thinks I'm pretty good on the on the on the you know on the simple things. But all those things that cause that come from a man's heart, uh, those are the things that you don't even know about. So I guess it's it's, it's maybe I'm beginning to understand. Uh, beginning to at least in my mind understand the reason why I'm here. To love my neighbor as myself. To love God with all my heart, mind, and soul and my neighbor as myself. Here's the trick. If I knew how to love God, I would be in good shape. I don't know how to love God. Scripture also says that how can you say that you love God and don't love your neighbor? How can you say you love God who you haven't seen and you despise your neighbor who you have seen? The closest that we can come to loving God is to love our neighbor. We can do that one. Love God? We don't even know what that means. We don't even know what, God, what is God? I mean, let's be honest. You know, we have an idea that fits our own picture of who God is and all that. But our neighbor, we knew it. That's pretty concrete. We knew that we knew that guy is. But God, we don't know who God is. We don't know who God is. And, uh, and if he appeared to us, we wouldn't even know who he was. Even if someone were to come back to us from beyond the grave, we wouldn't, wouldn't be enough to change us. I became a priest because I thought that I could serve the Lord better. I thought that it was my calling. When I was around 12 years old, I went to my grandmother's church called Donovan's Chapel. It was an AME church in Jeff City, Missouri, which doesn't exist anymore. Oh, what a, what, a, what, a, what a neighborhood that was when I was growing up. We're in just in the nativity season. And I remembered uh, on Christmas Eve going down the side of this hill toward um, after, after having attended a Christmas pageant at Lincoln Laboratory high, uh, 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 Elementary and, and High School combination in Jefferson City, Missouri. This was before they had integrated schools. There was a segregated school in Jeff City called Lincoln Laboratory. And we were, I was a wise man, one of the three wise men in the Christmas play. And I remember my grandmother put a towel around my head and I had a brown plaid uh, flannel uh, bathrobe on with a with a with this a cord around the middle and that was supposed to be my shepherd's robe and I came down the hill and I came past this building one this building called the Tiger Hotel which was an inter, a segregated hotel it was for black people only in Jeff City Missouri and then we walked down a little bit further till we came to uh, Mr. Taves Barber Shop, and then we went by Mama Leona, Mrs. Leona's barbecue restaurant, and then we went on up the hill past Little Donovan's Chapel to my grandmother's house. My grandmother took me to Donovan's Chapel, and because um, I always lo I loved to be with her, I loved to be with both my grandmothers because they let me be who I was. Everybody else was always trying to tell me uh, what, what I should be or how I should behave. But they just 
Uh, they just knew how to love me. I suppose that's what it is. So we went there to the to the to the altar call, and my and I, everybody was going up to the altar call, kneeling down, and asking for the Lord to bless them. And my grandmother said, "You know, you're going to be a preacher one of these days, and uh, you ought to go on up there." And I went, oh, "Okay, I'll do it," because she said so, and I did. And something from the eternal touched my life, and I felt like, "Aha! Now I found it." Now I've found it. Now I know what I can do. And, uh, you know, I felt like that was my first calling to be a preacher. And uh, so my calling to be, uh, you know, to be a servant of God as a, as a minister, priest, did not begin when I became part of the Orthodox Church. It began began when I was a a young boy of no more than 12 years old and and from my grandma Dorothy's church. But sometimes I feel like my whole ministry is, um, you know, all by myself. And uh, even when we have young people who are becoming part of the ministry, I also know that they have, um, you know, they have um, some maturing to do. And uh, when you look around and see in your illness that it's the Lord that takes care of you, and the Lord is the Lord's ministry and not yours, and that he'll take care of it, it takes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humbling experience. Yeah, humbling experience.